So if you love Peter McKinnon, Andrew Kramer, or anything Adobe, you're really gonna like this video. Um, we got to go to the NAB show and we were backstage looking at all of the latest Adobe features and software updates. And then throughout the day, there were some really cool talks. So we were lucky enough to get really close to the stage at uh, Peter McKinnon and Andrew Kramer talk. So we thought we'd share the video and the experience with you. So some of the video is a little bit shaky and there's a uh, little heads bopping around, but it was such a good talk that we thought we'd share it with you. But anyway, let's watch the video. <laughs> Let me get my camera. Oh. Happened. So when this came to be and this idea was presented to us, you're like, get on the phone with Andrew, see what you guys want to kind of do together as far as ideas go. And I was like, oh, okay, like I know you're amazing at VFX. So I thought, okay, it'd be cool if we like ran into the warehouse, fired some guns, I throw them a briefcase, and then it disappears, and then it's over, and blah. And I actually called him and pitched him that idea. And I remember hearing him go, yeah. Why don't we like have an overpass explode and a transport truck comes flying off of it and cars and in that very moment I thought to myself, awesome, great first impression. <laughs> if I knew that caliber was available, my idea would have sucked a little less, but dude, that thank you. Thanks for you. That's so good. Uh negotiating tactics, all right? Always aim a little higher. <laughs> Bring it down. Uh, no, actually that is true. Peter said the first thing he wants to do is uh, put on the squat outfit and like shoot a big gun. I was like, let's do it. It's my dream. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the production, you know, we wanted to have a fun stunt, a fun action thing. And, you know, I didn't even know content aware film was part of it. I was like, I have a bridge. And they're like, it's supposed to disappear. I'm like, no problem. Make it disappear. Yeah. Uh, but the fun part was just coming up with ideas on like what we should do with this, right? Because every idea involves like being cruel to like people or like a boat or, you know, and it's like sandwich into someone's hands or... That was my favorite gag, somebody eating a sandwich and then they go to erase the sandwich but it erases the person and the sandwich falls. <laughs> but we didn't have the budget, no. Look. So we, I mean, we, we, so we shot the whole thing in about five hours and we did a lot of different bits which was a lot of fun because as a vlogger, making tutorials, that kind of thing, I kind of just make it up as I go. I don't really plan it out. So I kind of just showed up here with my vlog camera, just classic P, like, ah, what's up? What's up, Andrew? And then he's over here with a storyboard and lists. And he's like, all right, we're gonna rock this out. We got different bits that we're gonna do. So it was really interesting to see his mind work in that regard versus, you know, flying by the seat of your pants all day, every day. And it's turned out awesome. Yeah, so obviously we shot it all on a green screen. Some keys better than others. But given what we have, eight days, we do about 50 visual effect shots. Yeah. Uh, I should give a big shout out to the uh, video co-pilot crew, Desi, Trevor, Jake, Fabian, like these guys. Uh, Good job. Guys. It took me eight days just to make the vlog. And then you did that. But, you know, it was just a fun, a fun challenge to try to create something that was, you know, part of your vlog, but also a little bit crazy, because you know, I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Should we show them the little bonus secret ending at the very end? Yeah, so I see, there's just this little, little extra, little extra. There's a stop sign. That's interesting. So I had a question for you. How long did just the truck scene take? Because I was, I'm unfamiliar with how a lot of that works. And that was created from completely nothing. Yeah. So that, we started on that pretty early on. Uh, I think that finished one day early than the rest of the keys. Um, you know, when you do a CG sequence, you could say, all right, you do a full CG sequence. So you build the overpass, you build the background, you build the trucks, the cars, and you try to figure out, okay, what are the shots? Like every shot is 
has specific things, right? So you have the shot, us looking, and the bridge disappears. You have the shot, uh, you know, on the ledge where one car goes over, uh, and then you have the shot down below. And so you try to sync it all up into one sequence because that way then you can just move the camera around and get the different shots. You don't have to create a unique scene for each truck, uh, each bit. Uh, and so I think, you know, we, we approach it from, okay, let's get, you know, let's get 89% there, right? Let's like make it really good, maybe not headlights, maybe not street lights, but let's pick all the things that are gonna stand out the most because of the tight schedule. And I think that's a really important strategy when you're doing a lot of visual effects, is you want them all to be risen to a certain bar, and you have to accept what that is and understand what that is going into it, and that way you can be successful, because we can always make a visual effect shot a little bit better, but when you see it all together as a whole piece and it's cohesive, it just works a lot better than having one really amazing visual effect shot and then, you know, yeah. I remember you saying, when we were texting, I mean, I was texting him all week, show me something, show me something, and he waited to the last minute to show me anything, but I remember you saying you were working on like the big finale because it's the most important. Um, I think one of the cool things I learned working with like visual effects stuff, again, first time, was the little details that I never thought of. When we were shooting, you would keep saying, it's so important where your line of sight is. We won't dive into that again. I think that that was something that I took home. And I think if anyone here is interested in doing that kind of thing, that was a huge factor of what made this actually work. Yeah, you know, I think anytime you think about a scene that's filmed in real life, you know, you have an over the shoulder, and you have you have the 180 rule. You any, even in a virtual production, you want to think about all that stuff. What are they looking at? Where is the light source from the main scene? And that's why a lot of big stunt scenes sometimes have just kind of a generic overcast day because you can kind of light everything generically, maybe have a key light or a backlight. Um, but as far as the eye line, we're just thinking, okay, what are we looking at? Are we looking down at something? Because the camera's, you know, usually the camera's gonna be eye level, uh, you know. If we're looking down, our eyes need to look that way. If we're looking up, we need to look that way. And we can't both be like looking at something because it's very easy to tell. Like I can look at you guys, I can see if you're looking at me or if you're Peter. Obviously he's better looking, so I don't blame him. But the point is, you gotta get those eye lines synced, otherwise it, it ruins the feel that you have that you're looking at the same thing that they're looking at. Yeah, I, I remember we would pick certain things when we were shooting. So like right now, we'd say the NDI, Sign the Adobe Blast thing, this guy over here in the burgundy shirt, we're gonna look at him, and then on three we're gonna react. And it was just, it was weird reacting to nothing. Because most of the time, if you're vlogging and you're in the moment, or you're filming a video, and you say something, and you're like, hey, that looks like a Tron Leaf hat. And you're like, oh, that's cool. But if I'm not here and someone's just telling you guys to do that, it's a totally different experience. So being able to just, figure it out. Cool. Yeah, one cool thing is that when you do film on a green screen, what's cool is you can resync a performance. So if we're standing here and we're supposed to both like, you know, look up at something exciting and, you know, maybe I'm a little off or he's, you know, what you can do is you can cut the clip in half and then just shift the time until you get that sort of moment, you know, everybody's doing the exact same thing. And that's a technique they use a lot in editorial from here. There's a lot of like stabilizing shots, putting it back in. We, we shot 4K and we just shot a little bit wider so we could have a little bit of room to reposition the shots and zoom in. Um, and that's, I mean, to me, that's the benefit of 4K is just being able to reframe shots. And especially if you're cutting back to a shot, you can cut to a close-up or then you can cut back to a wide. You have that flexibility to, to not feel like you're just cutting to the same shot each time. It gives the software just more options. You can just stabilizing anything like that. It just makes it easier on the software performing whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah, so. I'm trying to think of some of the weird tricks. I mean, you know, you're you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, there's five shots in the sequence. How can we how can we reuse the key settings? Because all of the keys were pretty much the same. So we created basically a pre comp that had all of the master settings. And then we could use that to say, okay, if we refined it, made it a little bit better, we could incorporate that into other shots, but we always try to reuse as much of the work because, I mean, it was critical. Like, I think we finished the video uh, about, what, 2 a.m. last night, and I, and I drove out here from California. Here I, I, I watched it in the airport lounge. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, I think we got time for questions. So uh, we got a microphone. If you guys want to know anything specific about the process of making this video or anything at all, what Andrew was wearing that day. Was the box that the product was delivered in, was that CG or was that a real cool box that you had? No. So Adobe is going to be releasing when you heard it here first. No, it's completely fake. He made the whole box. <laughs> All I did was I, he made a foam cutout with that little device inside it, which was actually a carbon okay. Yeah, so we started. <laughs> so he's like t talking about like, hey, uh, I'm going to come and film some behind the scenes stuff. And, uh, and I'm like trying to be like, uh, what's our prop? Like, what's our gadget? So I got like a, like a, you know, whatever, a card reader, covered up all the slots with some like tape. Gaff, gaff tape. Gaff tape. And then just took like a little, like a, a remote button and put it on the end, like as a good, you know, and then just put a, literally super glued a button on top of it. And then for the box, because I knew it would be cool if you could pull it out of something and like touch it, right? So it was just like uh, styrofoam. We had some styrofoam, we cut it. Uh, I cut a shape around the prop to fit right in there. And then when he's reaching into it, we, so to give you an idea, he's reaching into it, we put a green screen behind his hand. And so then he's reaching into it, and then what we did is we created a box that was behind the phone and in front of the phone, but also behind his hand. So you're basically CG the box underneath the styrofoam so that it looks like it's one piece. And then our CG artist, Ramiro, he, uh, he even has like shadow casting on the box as it's lifting up, you know, these guys. I don't know, maybe by show of hands, anyone else feel like they're gonna get a nosebleed just listening to how that was done? <laughs> just me. <laughs> Thanks for your question, man.